Welcome to From Rome Info video. My name is Brother Alexis Pinello, and I'm the publisher and editor of FromRome.info, an electronic journal for news commentary about the Vatican, Rome, Italy. In this video, I want to um, uh, comment or reply on Dr. Timothy Gordon's idea that if what Benedict did has no precedent, the Church could decide one day that what he did was a valid renunciation. And I say Dr. Tim Gordon because he holds a doctorate in, in sacred theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University, or at least I understand that he does, <clears throat> which is a Jesuit institution. He was also president of um, a society in the United States, a local chapter of the Society of the United States, I think it's called the Federalist Society, which is um, um, Americanist in, in, to a certain extent. <clears throat> and his opinion is that since there is uh, no precedent, the Church in the future could decide that uh, what Benedict did was a valid renunciation and that uh, the Church was right in uh, accepting it as such. And he talks also about, you know, can the Pope even bifurcate monis and ministerium? So my response here is a technical one for those who already know the argument. If you really want to know it in detail, I will link... Uh, in this, uh, this video to my page at From Rome and uh, post a link to my seven part documentary, which uh, most of which I think Patrick Coffin has watched and uh, incorporated into his own position. And I've commented on Patrick Coffin's uh, concept of standing on moral certainty, certainty also at From Rome, and I'll give you a link to that. But now to reply or respond to the assertion of Dr. Timothy Gordon. First of all, um, uh, Dr. Gordon, uh, maybe I can call you Tim, uh, Timothy, uh, your presuppositions are false because you presuppose that in the Catholic Church uh, there is such a thing as legal precedent. Okay, the Catholic Church's law of the Roman right now is uh, based on Roman law, which has no concept of precedent. A thing is or is not because the law says it is or is not. You cannot say we've been doing this for so much time and therefore um, that establishes legal precedent. There is a concept of custom and custom establishes a law if it has been in practice 25 years. So the correct term would be custom. We have no such custom, not precedent. However, um, the church can overturn custom. As a matter of fact, in the 1983 Code of Canon Law of John Paul II, it begins it by saying this code replaces all previous existing legal customs because in Roman law, customs can be abolished. This is not true in common law. Common law, a, a custom, a precedent of long standing cannot be abolished. It's considered established. Though perhaps in some countries they have articles that allow that. So we cannot even advance a theory of precedent, okay, from the point of, of merely uh, uh, right, uh, that is ju jurisprudence. Uh, the other problem with uh, your theory, Tim, is that the Pope is the vicar of Jesus Christ, to whom on his ascension declared to us, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me by the Father. Therefore, uh, since, uh, the successor St. Peter is the vicar of the one who has all authority in heaven and earth, you can't even claim there's a necessity for precedent because the Pope can do something that has never been done by any previous Pope. Uh, because uh, having all authority and being the vicar of the one who has all authority, there's no limit to um, doing something new. As long as it is not contrary to divine, moral, natural, and evangelical law. Okay, so the Pope could actually create a new legal system, which is not contrary to those pre-existing laws, natural, divine, moral, or evangelical, that would be neither Roman nor common law. He could do that, and no Pope has ever done that, and that would have no precedence, but it would still be valid and it would be obliging, because he is the vicar of Christ. And to that extent, he holds a liberty of action that no other human ruler does, because his authority doesn't come from creatures. His authority comes from the Creator, who is not bound by human custom, human laws, or human preconceptions. 
I, I do not mean by that is uh, acts contrary to reason, because reason itself is God's gift to us, I should say intellectuality. So the Pope can do things new that have never been done before, and so, uh, Tim, your, your, your confusion or your, your, your scruple about legal precedent has no necessary foundation. The second of all, the third point I want to make out is it isn't correctly to, correct to say bifurcation. Okay, so there is munis and there is ministerium. That is admitted in the Code of 1983. So it's not a novelty, it's actually established in law. And the terms mean different things because you can see in, uh, I think, Canon 148, uh, um, that every office is defined as a munis. Nowhere in the code does it say that an office is a ministerial. Matter of fact, in Canon 1331, uh, number two, section four, before Bergoglio changed it and got rid of it, uh, someone excommunicated could not obtain an office, a dignity, or munis in the church. He was not prohibited, however, from obtaining a ministerium. So that it, it, it's clear that in the code, these words mean two different things. So there doesn't need to be a precedent. The Pope has the liberty to um, distinguish among these terms. So the proper term would be to say distinguish and not bifurcate. Bifurcate implies a separation. And uh, Pope Benedict never said he separated these terms. Okay. Can you renounce one and not the other? Obviously you can if you're the Pope. And uh, uh, you're in a legal system where the terms are distinguished because you have the power of action and you're the vicar of Christ. Your act is not against the natural, divine, moral, or evangelical laws. Now here we're going to speak in precisely. It's not against the natural law because even St. Thomas and all the great uh, philosopher thinkers, thinkers admit a distinction between being and action. So it's not a novelty to distinguish between being and action. Matter of fact, the code, Munis, the, in the Code of Canon Law of 1983 of John Paul II, the fact that the terms are used in different senses admits the church, admits there's a distinction between being and action, and that these terms represent that. So Benedict's not doing something that is novel according to uh, distinction, but obviously has done something that it, would, uh, it is not so easy to establish in the history of the church that some other popes done, although there have been popes who gave up control of the Vatican and Rome, uh, like Urban II, for eight years and then took it back by force of arms. So you can say on a practical level, there are popes who, without a renunciation, did uh, uh, relinquish ministerium of the Roman Church to a rival. But um, Patrick Hoffman is correct to say there has been no act of renunciation that makes this distinction. In that sense, it is novel and has no precedent. Uh, but those arguments are irrelevant because the Pope has the power to do it and he can do it. And um, now the question comes, like Michael Vorce, well, if the Pope actually did that, he'd be a wicked man. And here we have to remember that the Roman Pontiff, as the Vicar of Christ on earth, can be judged by no man. Only Christ is his judge. We have to admit and recognize that in the Catholic Church there is a hierarchy beyond which we cannot um, transgress uh, in our judgments, so we are infected in the modern times since the French Revolution of judging all our leaders and all our, uh, all our superiors. And to a certain extent, there is some truth in that, but in another sense, there is not. Because insofar as someone has legitimate divine authority to govern and has no superior on earth or in his jurisdiction, we cannot judge them. We could form a moral uh, certitude about whether they are right and wrong, but we cannot arrogate ourselves to um, uh, express a judgment uh, that would be binding on others, subjectively, we could say. But in regards to the Pope, it is not even subjectively morally licit to judge him uh, as a sinner or not a sinner. So Michael Vorce is very wrong on that point. Uh, the Pope could do a distinction between munis and ministerium as he could, did, if he was authorized by Christ to do it or saw it as an absolute necessity. Now, um, if you have something more than a mere um, partial or superficial understanding of church history under the pontificate of Benedict XVI and in the last 200 years, then you can see grave reasons for a, a moral necessity to um, um, 
deceive the Freemasons in the church of thinking their time has come when it has not come. And there is a, a wonderful documentary, not produced by myself, but in which I, f I feature, called A Message in the Bottle, and I'll put a link uh, uh, in the page for this video too about that, where um, I explain that at great length. Uh, so if Christ asked him to do, and Archbishop Ganswine said he was inspired to do this by Christ, uh, we can't judge him as wicked, and we can't judge he's not able to do it. And therefore, we come to the more important question, do we have to recognize that he's still the Pope, and uh, be, even though he's done something uh, that has no precedent? And the answer is yes, because he's the Vicar of Christ, and we must be subject to the decisions of the Roman Pontiff. Um, that's Boniface the Eighth, Unum Sanctum. You cannot be saved if you otherwise. So you may not like it, uh, but if it's not against the divine moral or natural law, and he's a validly elected, canonically appointed Roman Pontiff, you have to accept it, even though it finds mysterious. Now, perhaps the biggest argument is, um, like Bonaventure says, when a prelate gives up his ministry but wants to retain his office, that's in a normal sense, that's diabolical because that's the sin of Lucifer and his angels, that they wanted the dignity of being ministers of God, but they didn't want to serve God anymore. They wanted to do their own thing. And uh, Bonaventure says that's likened to stars being driven out of heaven because they lose their orbit, where they, the, what ministry they should be doing, and they, they give that up. So if Benedict was not inspired by God, uh, uh, or if a Roman pontiff was not inspired by God to do such a thing, then at the level of theoretical morals, we could say that the act would be wicked and gravely so. So in that sense, Michael Voris, there's a lot of truth in what he says. But we can't judge a certain Roman pontiff of having done something gravely wicked, especially if his secretary says he was inspired by God. Now, we could personally hold that maybe he was deceived by an angel of light, and that is possible. And... Uh, and that matters, we are free to opine one way or the other, but we can't judge him, that's the uh, judgment of Christ, uh, his soul. It's hard, though, for people to understand why Benedict would do such a thing, which would lead the average Catholic who's not paying attention to be deceived by a deceiver for eight years to the destruction of many souls, and uh, even to the point of being uh, genocided by globalists. And um, I think you have to recognize what, those apparitions the church has approved, like La Salette, where Our Lady says, Our Lord is already so fed up with all the sins that his heavy hand of judgment is ready to fall. And we have to understand that though Christ prefers the salvation of all men, it could happen at some time in the history of the church that so many people gravely offend him that he permits their destruction. We saw this already in the Great Death in Europe where a third of Catholics died in a matter of 18 months by the uh, Black Plague. Why did God permit that? So um, our sins can bring down punishment on us, and the sins of an entire community can bring back punishment on them, and even in the mystical body this is possible. We are not a members of a society where God will never punish us on earth just because we're Catholic. And uh, well, if we look at how we are Catholic, whether we even all believe everything, or whether we practice everything, I think we have to objectively recognize that we're far from what Christ would want and therefore that the divine displeasure could be so great that he would put us to the test. And here we come into that change of the fa our father that Bergoglio is promoting. Oh, we can't say, do not put, uh, lead us into temptation. The correct meaning of that phrase is put us to the test. That's what the late Latin means, put us to the test. Uh, Bergoglio's translation is completely wrong and is based on a, a, an erroneous Spanish translation. But God can put us to a test. He can let us fall into a circumstance which makes us fail completely so that we see that what we're doing is not the divine will and of ourselves we are not God's. And uh, he, it, he is, his justice obliges him to act that way if he wants to free us from idolatry and bring us back to himself by preparing the path to, by a fact that we accomplish uh, showing that how wrong we were. And uh, if Benedict what he did what he did div by divine inspiration, and our Lord did that because he's really upset about the level of sins in the church, and I think everyone can be agreed that he probably is, uh, even before, uh, from the, just from the point of view of pedophilia or modernism in the church where everything is going on since Vatican II, then it is reasonable 
that he was inspired to do something that would put the whole church to a test. And Andrea Cianci of the Libero in Italy has explained this at great length in a, in a thesis called The Ratzinger Code. And you can search for it on the web. And he has uh, gone through everything uh, significant that Benedict has said before, after uh, February 2013 to show it's all consistent that this is what he did and why he did it. So I think that f fully explains why your position, Tim, that um, the church could at future time regard what he did as valid, a valid renunciation, even though he's distinguishing we can do this tombs, is totally wrong. The church at the future time will regard the renunciation as invalid because to renounce the office, you must renounce the being of the thing, not just the uh, action of the thing. And Patrick Coffin's opinion that he has renounced the action and therefore can't go back to it is philosophically unsound because as long as you hold the root of power, which is the office, the being of the thing, you can exercise again the ministerium. God bless. Have a merry